On a Monday, we like to check in with the Australian Christian Lobby and talk about those issues that are shaping the political agenda for the week ahead, turning our attention to, as I said, what's considered one of the most complex and controversial medical issues confronting our society today, and an important motion that has come before the South Australian Parliament. One member in South Australia is calling for a select committee to be established to inquire into and report on young people seeking assistance for gender dysphoria in South Australia. Christopher Brohier is the ACL State Director for South Australia, Tasmania and the Northern Territory. Christopher's back with us. Hey Christopher, welcome back to 2020. Well, Christopher was with us. I think uh, they're... Oh, yeah. Are you with us, Christopher? Have yep. I got you? I've got you. Okay. <laughs> I thought you dropped out for a moment. Hey, Christopher, the motion in South Australia, that's uh, been put by the Honourable Frank Pangello, who wants a select committee to, as, to be established to inquire and report on young people seeking assistance for gender dysphoria. Uh, what are your understandings about that particular motion? Yes, Neil, so thanks for that. Um, so last Wednesday, Mr. Pangallo uh, moved a motion for his inquiry into um, the uh, treatment of young South Australians who are suffering from gender dysphoria. And he laid out his reasons in a very good speech, which you can access uh, on the South Australian Parliamentary website or on the ACL Facebook page. One of the critical stories he told was a letter that he'd received from a father who had, whose, whose young 11-year-old daughter was uh, sex-confused, if you like, and the mother wanted her to be medicated through puberty blockers. He didn't. He had concerns. They went to the gender clinic in South Australia, and basically he was told that even though he didn't agree, um, is, they were going to go ahead. And he asked about uh, side effects. They were given a fact sheet, and all this little girl was told was there was a risk of osteoporosis, and she didn't get any other help. So this father took the fact sheet and explained it line by line to his daughter, and all of the risks, um, and there are many, including loss of fertility, um, uh, all the risks of male development, etc. And the day before she was going to have her first injection, um, she decided not to go ahead. He explained to her that there are varieties of of of, of women, varieties of interests, varieties of of feelings, uh, and you don't just because you have a particular interest doesn't mean you're a boy. When you're a girl, girls can girls can lop trees just as much as boys can. Um, so, uh, that story really encapsulates, uh, the reason for this inquiry to find out exactly what's happening in the gender clinics and whether, as, as the evidence suggests, children are just being pushed through without proper explanation. And we now know that there are serious risks with all of this. There's, um, life changing consequences like bone weakening, there's, loss of fertility, and that we now know there are a number of detransitioners uh, with tragic stories. So one lady who is suing, it's been in the paper, she had a double mastectomy, she had a hysterectomy, and she still suffered from mental health. She was still suicidal until she got some counselling help to help her to see that she was who she was, that she was a woman, and she's now come back to a place of more stability, and she's now... Uh, I understand suing the doctors. So this is a massive, this is one of the articles published in the Australian described this as the biggest medical scandal of this century. And so it's really important that this inquiry gets up. The biggest medical scandal of the century. And I do note uh, that one of the, uh, one of the clauses in the motion uh, says that the, uh, the select committee should authorise the disclosure or publication as it sees fit of any evidence or documents presented to the committee prior to such evidence being presented to the council. This thought of the amount of disclosure that comes when 
uh, there are documents submitted somehow or other. There seems to be a blockage, doesn't there, that the media is not getting the access to those sorts of things and perhaps our legislators are not giving attention to these sorts of documents. Uh, what are your thoughts here not, about I, that sort I, of thing? Yeah, I don't think that was in the motion that was put to Parliament. Uh I, I don't know where that comes from, but it, it wasn't in the motion that was put to Parliament. Right. So the part, the, the motion that Mr. Pangello is putting forward, and, and he said he doesn't come at this from an ideological perspective. He wants that the Parliament to understand uh, what's going on because the people of South Australia are funding this. And so we need to understand exactly what's happened and exactly the science behind it. One of the interesting things he said, Neil, was that one of the doctors who, in fact, set up the gender clinic had spoken recently at a conference and had said something to the effect that the evidence base for, for this sort of treatment, the medicalization, is weak. And that's, if you look at overall the scientific papers that are coming out, and, and this is not just um, an ACL um, right-wing agenda, countries like Finland, Sweden, Norway, UK, France, and states in America have all pulled back from this treatment because they've recognized that the evidence base is not there. There is serious harm caused. And the proper way to deal with this, a lot of these kids have what they call comorbidities, other issues going on, like autism spectrum disorder. There's issues like uh, eating disorders, things like that. And psychotherapy to deal with those issues should be the first point of call. We should not try to cure uh, psychological issues by a scalpel. Interesting when you put your head up above the parapet uh, that Frank Pangello, uh, who says this is not ideologically motivated, but, uh, but he says... I fully expect to be attacked by the trans activists and ideologues who dominate the arena. Uh, there's a lot of people who come under attack and therefore a lot of politicians who are reluctant to actually uh, speak up here. Any thoughts from you on uh, just, uh, you know, having that little bit of extra courage and I guess even honour to Frank Pangello for actually uh, putting his head up above the parapet here? Yes, uh, I think what politicians... Uh it's a tough gig to be a politician, and it's a tough gig because the the lobby that promotes this affirmation therapy is very strong, and they will go completely on the attack. There's no rational debate. It's just an ad hominem attack on people to shut it down, which is indicative, in my view, of the lack of evidence. And for listeners to understand, the history of medicine has always had these these therapies which have proved to be wrong. So in the 50s, we would do lobotomies on people uh, to cure what were thought to be antisocial traits, and that destroyed people. Interestingly, Neil, in the 70s, there was a move to give some sort of medication, some sort of hormones to short men and tall women because it was thought that that would... Uh, that would being as short as a man or tall as a girl would limit your chances of get, getting married. And that caused disaster. So, so some of the men had early onset dementia. So it, it's, 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 it's no strange thing that this happens in medicine, that people get ideas and they go off on a wrong track. This, in my submission on the evidence, is one of those. And really it is... Politicians who will be honoured in the future are those who will stand up and, and have this investigation and, and bring the evidence to light. And I guess one of those, um, someone on that side, a counterpart in the federal sphere, Senator Alex Antic, uh, he's been copping a bit too, hasn't he, with a private member's bill to stop puberty blockers being given to children under 18. Uh, he's another one with a little bit of courage to actually stand up and and uh, defend uh, the lives of these children who'd be affected for a lifetime of medicalization. Yes, he's got... I think Alex antic has got courage in spades and um, he's put this bill up. Uh, it's 
to get it through the federal parliament is is a tough ask, but at least he's bring it out there. And that's the encouraging thing that there are more and more people now who are bringing this out into the open and so that we as a community can have a debate. This is not a, a this is for the mums and dads of parents. This is affecting all of our children. And so it is imperative that we understand the science and understand the developing science which says that this sort of affirmation treatment is harmful. And getting the groundswell of support for this uh, no doubt comes to ordinary people, perhaps people listening to our conversation today, um, sending a note of encouragement, um, signing various uh, opportunities, uh, you know, where there are online um, opportunities to support these sorts of initiatives. I guess that's your encouragement ongoing. Yes, so we've got a, uh, a email campaign going. Uh, you can go to www.acl.org.au and you'll find you can send emails to the Upper House MPs. Now, that's only for South Australians. We don't want really everybody writing in to them because in the end, they only listen to people from their state. But for people around the country to write to your local MP and say, I'm concerned about this. What is happening in our state? Should we have an inquiry in our state? We need to know because it's public funds that are going into this and we need to know what's happening. Now, you travelled to Europe just recently and uh, you were looking at issues around uh, models uh, for uh, prostitution. Uh, let's just turn our attention another issue on your agenda in South Australia is the progress of the Equality Model Bill uh, decriminalising selling and criminalising buying of prostitution. Uh, what did you discover when you were overseas? Um so it was a very useful trip. We went to Sweden because Sweden is where this model originated. And the intent was this model has been in 25 years up in some laboratory or some academia. When of prostitution in, in Sweden, a researcher went and involved in the trade from their lived experience that prostitution, prostitution was violence against women. Now, I know people will say there are, there are men involved, absolutely, but it's a very small percentage. 95% of the women in, people in prostitution are women. And so they devised this scheme where the women were, de sellers were decriminalized, so they could exit. The, the buyers were criminalized to reduce demand and so were third party profiteers and there were exit strategies provided. And it, it's been really remarkable, uh, Neil, because we met with the police, we met with um, uh, social workers and we met with NGOs. And what they do is the police and the social workers and the NGOs will go out together to visit the women uh, because the women aren't doing anything wrong. So they can speak to them, they build up trust and say, can we offer you some help? Sometimes the NGOs will befriend them and have them for coffee and things like that. And they find that a, a, a poignant story that they told was of a young Romanian girl they met. And when they went to see her, she came close. She, was a, she only spoke Romanian. She came close to the social worker who spoke Romanian and whispered, I can't say anything because they'll hurt me. And he said, your boyfriend and pimp have been arrested. And she collapsed back in the chair and she told the the, the, the horrendous story she'd been put through. So people say it doesn't work. In, in, ignorant people in Australia say that it does work. It's worked for 25 years in Sweden. It's seen a remarkable drop in prostitution. Here's an interesting stat, Neil. Uh, they did a survey a couple of months ago, and in Sweden, 7% of men admit to buying sex, and 80% of that cohort have bought sex outside of Sweden. In Germany, which has got decriminalization, 26% of men admit to buying sex. That's a remarkable change. In France, 
um, which is a very comparable country to Germany, it's down to a, to uh, just around 10 or under 10 percent because they've got the Nordic model. Germany has 400,000 people in prostitution. France has about 30,000. Uh, so for the care for women, this model is somewhere where South Australia can lead the way. And it's, it's my plea to all who are listening. If you're in South Australia, write to your local MPs, particularly the upper house. And my plea to the upper house MPs is to support this model. So uh, that's a really powerful and uh, profound statistic that you quote there, uh, suggesting a comparison between France and Germany. And in France, they've got something like thirty to 40,000 people in prostitution. Germany has 400,000 in prostitution. And uh, no doubt, uh, that's why the German Chancellor says that the government is open to criminalising buying as they try to reduce prostitution in Germany. Hey, time is running out. One more quick little comment from you. Uh, so far as Jewish people in Australia and with the war that's going on between Israel and Hamas in the Middle East, um, people are feeling it on our streets and in their homes here in Australia. Uh, you've been monitoring too just how people are feeling uh, here in Australia. What are your thoughts? Well, I met with the Jewish one of the Jewish rabbis, the author, the traditional Jewish rabbi in Adelaide last week. And he told me of an incident where there was a, a, a Jewish group, about 50 people having a vigil in one of our streets. At the other end, there was a group of people protesting in support of Palestine. And the other group was supposed to walk the other way, but they came and surrounded the Jewish group and they felt really threatened. The police had to come and escort them out. And I just want to say, clearly, that should not happen in Australia. We should stand with the Jewish people. We should support them. They, I, I, I've just come back from Auschwitz in Poland and we saw the terrible um, atrocities that were done there. And it, I read a statement, the 11th commandment is don't, thou shall not be silent. And we must not remain silent when Jewish people are under pressure. We must stand with them. And uh, that's good to have an 11th commandment. Uh, that's right. Uh, thou shalt not remain silent. Hey, Christopher Bro here. Appreciate your insights as always. And uh, for listeners, connecting with Christopher, connecting with the Australian Christian Lobby, the website is acl.org.au, acl.org.au. Christopher Bro here is ACL State Director for South Australia, Tasmania and the Northern Territory. Christopher, appreciate your insights. Thanks so much for joining us once again today on 2020. Thank you, Neil. 